My name is Mary Hickok. I'm the president for Center for AI and Digital Policy. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, independent nonprofit organization, incorporated in Washington, D.C., but we work on a global level. And for the last few years, we have been involved in not only in OECD AI principles, UNESCO, but also EU AI Act, intimately with EU AI Act, Council of Europe AI Treaty, uh, as well as some of the other regulatory conversations happening so we can keep a global uh, perspective. And we also have an education, in, in addition to our advisory and adv uh, advocacy arm, uh, we also have an education arm where we look at these different frameworks and talk about the convergences and divergences on the norms and instead of inventing the wheel again and again in every conversation, in every country, can we work on the established norms already? So hence, the, uh, hence this panel. And I'm really excited for my co-panelists joining me today. So from left, uh, we have Eleni Costa from Tilburg University. We have Chade from Microsoft. And I'm, oh, I have already apologized for the pronunciation. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Third day, last session. Shade from Microsoft. Thanks. Daniel Luffer from Access Now. And em Emilio Di Capitano from uh, Civil, Liberties Civil, Civil Liberties Committee and, and Free Group. Uh, so what we want to look at, as I mentioned, is the convergences on some of these norms and what we should be looking, how, sh how we should build on some of these norms and also what is not happening what else that we need to do on this. Uh, I'm going to start the conversation with uh, some of the global, net, global frameworks that I mentioned and roll back the time a bit further uh, and mentioned universal guidelines for AI. And I have more copies of these guidelines uh, for, for you to pick up if you're interested, which was developed back in 2018 uh, by more than 300 researchers, academic researchers, as well as advocates, as well as uh, practitioners across 60 associations around the world, and ended up being the basis for OECD AI principles that were developed in 2019, uh, which is now, as if you're, if you're uh, familiar with the space, that also becoming the, uh, some of the established norms. And it provides, uh, rights, not provides, but it uh, requires organizations to respect the rights of the individuals and then provides obligations to, um, as obligations to companies and, and public actors. As you can see, that's a lot of the, conversa a lot of the regulatory uh, conversations we're having now. Um, and with that, Shada, maybe looking at the right direction now, apologies. Uh, with that, maybe let's start with you and what you see as the commonalities in different AI policy frameworks that we're talking globally right now uh, and what are the core tenets of governance. Thank, thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Correct. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Marva. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I think from, from the Microsoft perspective, um, you know, we're a global company, so we, we have, we get confronted with a lot of different types of uh, regulation and principles, and we've very much been um, leaning into all the discussions that are happening at the at the international level. They're extremely important uh, to get as many um, stakeholders and governments uh, aligned on on the on the core principles that that govern uh, that and that should be governing um, this uh, this evolving space, this fast evolving space. And I think when when you look at um, the, the main commonalities that you you mentioned, I think the, um, there are a couple of uh, there's a growing consensus among policymakers um, and researchers and stakeholders to have um, to promote really trustworthy, safe, ethical, and um, and transparent development and employment of of AI. And one of the really core tenets that that we see is, as as a right one is the human centeredness. Um, and you know, AI systems should really uh, be designed and used uh, to promote human uh, values and interests, um, privacy, dignity, autonomy, fairness, um, and, and non-discrimination. Um, and that's also really something that, that we, we will be very much um, advocating for uh, in uh, also going forward. 
um, there's a accountability that is extremely important. We have to be able to uh, uh, have clear lines of responsibility and accountability. Um, that's something that we'll also probably be touching upon later when, when the AI Act gets uh, gets discussed in, in more detail. Transparency, um, uh, you know, we have to have it, um, the AI systems being designed and operated in a way that is understandable uh, and transparent for users and stakeholders. And people need to know whether they're interacting with a with a, an AI system or not. Safety and reliability, privacy and, and data security, um, and, and as I said, um, diversity and non-discrimination. So that, that those are kind of the things that we really see as, as as horizontal things that keep coming back, and rightfully so. And I think that's that's what the um, um, the international organizations and, and governments, when we're looking at a at a more potentially global outcome, um, should really take into account very 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 um, strongly. Thank you for that. Uh, and I think over the years, like I said, um, st starting from privacy conversations, data protection conversations, as well as some of the human rights conversations that has been going on for, for decades the, uh, in terms of implications, AI has brought, obviously brought some new risks and challenges, uh, but definitely the, the norms that you're, you have mentioned are now converged and got a global agreement that this definitely should be uh, talked about and should be implemented. Whether we implement it is a different question, I suppose. Yeah, but I think maybe, maybe I mean, I think yeah. that, you know, different countries will eventually want to regulate AI in a different way. I mean, it's, it won't, we, I think we would be making a mistake to work towards uh, something that is the same for everyone because, um, you know, that will just simply take too long. I mean, it is going very fast. We need to make sure that both companies um, take their responsibility quickly um, and seriously, and that also governments um, can you know, have speed in how they uh, regulate. But of course, well thought through. And I think we are very much supportive of what's, work, what's going on in, in the EU. EU is, is, is very much on the forefront of, of tech regulation in general. Um, but also on AI, and I think there um, we're very much looking forward to the, the coming months when uh, co-legislators will finalize negotiations. It's a lot to discuss still. There's a lot of uh, complex issues, but I think that's um, that's going uh, it's going to be very important to get that right, um, but also do it swiftly. And um, um, but looking on the international level, I think you know it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but we really do need to look at developing shared taxonomies, um, develop and align international standards, and, and also accelerate research um, into how to apply AI to, um, to the biggest societal challenges. So not one size fits all, for sure, for because sure. that's not yeah, for sure. Um, Daniel, I'm going to turn back to you. And from EU coordinated plan, from US AI policy, G G7, G20 conversations and statements. Uh, and most recently, last week, with the G7 Hiroshima statements, as well as the transatlantic uh, conversations, we hear again and again what uh, Chad mentioned on trustworthy AI, human centricity, human dignity, but also focus on human rights and democratic values. Um, we see a lot of commitment to that, but what is actually necessary to get us to the implementation stage for that. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. No, I think it's really good to, to point out that in all of these, you know, global statements, very high level statements, we are seeing the language of protecting human rights, fundamental rights. And that is something I think to be celebrated because in 2018, that was not what we saw. It was all about ethics. You know, Microsoft had ethics guidelines, Google had ethics guidelines. Often they were quite utilitarian. And there was a big push from civil society to say, no, it's not about ethics guidelines and self-regulation. It's about human rights and it needs to be regulated. And I do think that the needle has moved. But just because we're seeing these commitments on this high level, that doesn't mean that we can relax because getting from high level statements about dignity, privacy and transparency that, you know, companies and governments can unproblematically and enthusiastically agree to, to actual concrete measures that will you know, restrict what they can do and perhaps impact their bottom line in the case of companies, uh, that's going to really be a challenge. Um, 
I mean, you know, just to to uh, one of one of the key things is that we go from having this talk about needing to protect rights to having really enforceable, actionable rights in relation to these systems. You know, in the EU, we're very lucky that we have the GDPR, and we're seeing how the GDPR is already uh, creating some trouble for OpenAI, for, for other companies. You know, Google have not yet launched BARD in the EU. Uh, they haven't said why, but they're probably waiting to see what happens with ChatGPT. Uh, and I really think it's, it's data protection is absolutely key. Uh, it's the absolutely key first step to regulating AI and needs to be done before we have dedicated AI regulation. And you know, when we're talking about the G7, not all of the G7 have national or federal data protection privacy regulations. And that has to be the key thing to think about. And I, I think we really need to be careful about companies, Sam Altman saying, oh, please regulate us and you know, give us an AI regulation, but behind the scenes perhaps, uh, you know, these same actors may be pushing back against more mundane things that are gonna be less palatable to the general public and to you know, newspaper headlines like federal data protection regulations. So we need to make sure that those things really go through. And I mean, just, just a final thing to say on that, I think, you know, companies, and you know, I'll, I'll hone in on Microsoft here because it's my duty when they're on the panel with me, but I could do it to Google as well or anyone else. Um, you know, it's easy to say, yes, human dignity, yes, privacy, yes, transparency, but you know, dignity. And here I'm treating OpenAI as a sort of extension of Microsoft because for practical purposes, that's what it is at the moment, I think. The Kenyan moderation uh, that was done in the reinforcement learning for human review uh, for ChatGPT, I'm sure you all saw the revelations that it was done in extremely bad labor conditions often, you know, really harrowing stuff that people had to go through. I don't know where human dignity comes in there with this cheap labor to make these systems work. Privacy, we've got mass scraped data sets where people didn't consent to have their information put into these things. And transparency, the latest paper on GPT-4, we have next to no information about how that model was developed. Um, and as well, just, you know, a final thing about Often when people talk about transparency, the, you know, we, we hear this example of people need to know when they're interacting with an AI system. That's important, but if we go back a few years, you may remember the revelations about all of the voice assistants, Alexa, Cortana, uh, Google Assistant, where people did not know that their conversations with these things were being listened to by humans. Uh, and the same thing with ChatGPT we're seeing again. So we, we do need to have transparency that people are interacting with chatbots, but people need to know when the information that they're divulging to chatbots or voice assistants is being used to train more models, can potentially be seen by human reviewers. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done and I do expect pushback when we get down into the nitty gritty of translating these big statements into things that could actually make a difference to people's lives. Thank you so much for that. And throughout this conversation, throughout this conference, I heard the question, uh, risk-based regulation versus rights-based multiple times asked. Uh, I haven't received a, uh, like full answer from the from the uh, regulator or policymaker side. To be honest, uh, still a conversation of why that we like, why we had that shift from GDPR with the GDPR experience. Um, Oh, but on the subject of risk-based risk-based regulation, Eleni, I'm going to come back to you, come to you. Um, there are multiple prohibited acts in AI acts. So when we talk about fundamental rights, uh, we are already talking about certain bans, certain prohibited acts that we are not comfortable with at all. That they should be banned. There is no like responsible or trustworthy development or use of them, and they should be banned from uh, from the get-go. So can you talk us about, about um, some of those prohibited uh, sure. practices and what has changed? Yeah, well, uh, thank you. I think we would need a long time to explore this. And uh, usually my students know that I love mm -hmm. to go on with the details and criticize very much what has been there. So I'll try to summarize the main critique. So first of all, uh, the AI regulation is based on the notion of risk. It's, it's an essential element to start studying the AI Act. We have a distinction between uh, low risk 
medium risk and high risk applications. And I guess and I hope many of you have seen this uh, triangle that the European Commission has uh, prepared with this equally distributed layers, which is actually not corresponding to the reality. Eh? So we have, um, I would call them uh, systems with minimum risk that actually they are allowed to go on the market. Then we have some risk where we need to uh, study uh, when we um, we actually need to make sure that there is enough transparency, whatever that means. Then we have the high risk uh, systems and there is a very complicated way through the annexes to specify what these high risks are. And there, the Liban, I guess uh, uh, you are going to discuss more about it, Emilio, uh, tried to change a little bit the, uh, the situation there. I'm not sure how successful they were. And then the tip of the iceberg uh, are the prohibited practices that actually has, have been really uh, highly debated. So uh, the commission uh, had four different types of prohibited practices. And I find it interesting because we have uh, definitions of systems, trying to understand what AI systems are, et cetera, et cetera. And then suddenly in Article 5, <coughs> we talk about practices. And then you start, oh, OK, what is, a is this a practice? Should it be a system and a practice? So already there, we have a problem. Um, so we have, first of all, AI systems deploying uh, subliminal techniques. Secondly, AI practices exploiting vulnerabilities based on specific criteria, social scoring systems, and real-time remote biometric identification systems. One of the uh, things that I found very interesting in the Libe Committee, and it was expected, uh, and that was also a lot of push from civil society, so we are happy to see that, we have um, quite a lot of amendments with regard to the prohibited, pra prohibited practices. Um, I'll try not to take too much time, but I would like to highlight them because not everyone is familiar with all the amendments uh, that have been tabled, and they are very lengthy documents. So I hope you can take this home and think about it. First of all, one, uh, and it's not the, the sequel that they are in the, in the amendments, but I found very interesting the fact that uh, the uh, European Parliament is proposing indiscriminate scraping of biometric data from social media or CCTV footage to create facial recognition databases. I think that's amazing. Let's see if it will stay there. Biometric categorization systems using sensitive characteristics, much broader than what it used to be. So now we have gender, race, ethnicity, citizenship, religion, political, blah, 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 which is also very big. Real-time remote biometric identification systems in publicly accessible spaces post-remote biometric identification systems with the only exception of law enforcement for the prosecution of serious crimes and only after judicial authorization. I expect this big pushback from the council on this. Here comes predictive policing systems based on, prof uh, on profiling and, um, uh, and uh, current or uh, location, sorry, or past criminal behavior. Well, let's see if law enforcement authorities will be happy about it. Emotion recognition systems in law enforcement, border management, workplace, and educational institutions. So these are big changes. And really, we should keep an eye on what's going to happen during the trialogue, because we see the, uh, the, the parliament really pushing for what we are arguing, more human rights, more uh, putting the citizen um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the discussion. Uh, also, we have an expansion of the concept of high risk, so not only the, uh, the, what was already there in the commission proposal with um, uh, the uh, products, uh, aviation and uh, national security related, etc., but also expanding to people's health, safety, um, fundamental rights in environment, also uh, voters in political campaigns and uh, in recommender systems that are used by social media platforms that are very uh, deployed by very large platforms, then you come, have to study the DSA as well. So we see an interconnection between different policy documents. But then, I'm sorry to spoil the party, there are many people that say, even if we have all these provisions in the AI Act, in reality, this remains a product safety regulation. Yeah. Because most of it is about conformity assessment. Then we, we study everything and we pay attention and we are, we are, we, this will give lawyers and technical people a lot of work. Thank you, but uh, you try to identify, I think you will spend so much time trying to identify whether your system or your practice falls under the AI Act. When you get through this threshold, then 
what do you do? You have to comply with all the conformity assessment procedures. And in the end, everybody will be focusing on that. I am afraid that everybody will be forgetting um, all the human rights uh, concerns. And everybody will be trying to put their products on the market. That's it. So I'm sorry if I sound a little bit pessimistic, but uh, I was hoping that the parliament would completely change the way how we treat AI. AI. And on <laughs> we asked them. <laughs> uh, def, def, I mean, the way that it started in 2021, in April 2021, when the first draft came out, the first pages are yeah. dual objective. One is market <coughs> harmonization, second, mm. protection of uh, rights, safety, uh, mm. and health of the individuals, was, right? But the uh, initial draft was uh, leaning more on market harmonization and market uh, alignment than uh, protection of rights. Even with the, with these bands, you're saying that we still have a lot to, a lot to go. And with that, I'm going to turn to you, uh, Emilio. Where are we now? What needs to happen with the uh, EU but Act? I, I thank Elaine, Eli, Eleni, because she already defined the, the, the framework. In fact, uh, I don't want to cite myself, but immediately after the publication of the draft report, uh, together with the, Michel de Brocard, we prepared a, a, a strong critique on the fact that instead uh, of uh, um, focusing on the frame, framing the fundamental rights from the point of view of the citizen, uh, the Commission had uh, chosen to uh, make something which was more uh, oriented to the market instead uh, to the to the rights so which is uh, rather funny because uh, uh, after the lisbon treaty at least in the preamble of the charter is clearly written that the european union should place the individual at the center of its own policies and <clears throat> in fact this is a fight that will continue also for the coming years but uh, it is also interesting to note that on this approach, there was also some reaction in the Council, not by hazard. The legal service of the Council was consulted on the fact that Article 16, uh, which is the one protecting uh, the data, the personal data, was only ancillary to the Article 114, or uh, in fact on the same ground, or even. Uh, um, I'm not sure if the audience can follow. Ah. This, I see some. Uh, yes, <laughs> Maybe I'm we sorry. can explain sorry. a little bit what's Article 16, uh, what is 114, and what happens in, usually. In fact, 114 what is. The, is the, <laughs> I think we're going to deep. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Is uh, the, the classical main legal base for protecting uh, the good, uh, smooth functioning of the internal market. So is more aimed to uh, um, frame the activity of the economic operators. Uh, instead, Article 16 of the Treaty of Function of European Union, which uh, implement uh, Article uh, 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, e uh, 7 and 8 of the, of the Charter, is an article which uh, recognizes a fundamental rights of the person to have protected his own data. And this is built on a evolution of the... Of the um, um, Strasbourg and of the La Luxembourg Court's jurisprudence, which in fact make uh, the European Union a rather um, epi, uh, singular case uh, in, in um, the Western world, let's say. But um, the point is that by choosing uh, more the market <coughs> than the rights, uh, a new big question uh, that Eleni was just uh, listing uh, exists because at the end of the day, uh, you should also have the possibility for a per a people to know that a threat exists, that maybe the right have been infringed. So you should have also a complaint mechanism, which is not just given by the goodwill uh, of someone, uh, but framed according uh, to the right to uh, a neutral and independent judge and so on. So it was not easy to, um, to deal with this, with this uh, aspects, 
And uh, uh, as far as I know, the, the two rapporteurs uh, have prepared their report for the uh, European Parliament plenary, maybe for June. And uh, <clears throat> it was not an easy task because there, wo there were more than 700 uh, uh, amendments. And as Eleni was more or less already in, in signalized, um, making clear, is that some of these amendments will have an hard way to pass uh, in the Council. So, uh, as I have to explain how it will work, the Parliament, and let's see if it will be voted, is a document of practically 300 pages, uh, will be voted by the plenary, but this will not be the final position of the plenary. We are in co-decision and we will start the so-called trilogue. So, uh, trilogue because it, there is not only the council, there will be also the commission uh, uh, working, I think, hard in a period of time which is more and more uh, small because uh, everything should be finished uh, at least for the beginning of 2024 because the election are in, in June. Uh, having the election in June, uh, you should uh, hand all your legislative work at least two months before, which means that uh, everything should be closed uh, for, uh, uh, let's say, March uh, under the Belgian presidency. But the hard work will be done in the, um, in the coming months, in summer and autumn and um, winter, under the Spanish presidency. It's not by hazard that just yesterday the incoming uh, council presidency sent a message to all the delegation that in the digital files, artificial intelligence will be their utmost priority. Looking as a civil society and citizen, and I say civil society because I was the uh, secretary of the Civil Liberties Committee, now I am a free retired person, but I, I, will, I am still very interested in following uh, uh, my old uh, um, issues. And uh, so we will try to follow uh, what will happen in the trilogues. And you know, the trilogues are still now something very uh, controversial and problematic. And I can tell you this because <clears throat> I had the chance to challenge this um, not transparent work before the Court of Justice who uh, mm, supported my thesis that trilogue are not just an informal meeting between friends at the uh, bar Europe, but is the, the real, the clue, the mm, most important phase of the legislative negotiation. Because after the trilogue, if an agreement is reached, there is no more possibility for amendments. Uh, so uh, it's extremely important that the civil society can follow uh, what is happening at that time. And uh, is, we have to say that the civil society is more like a dentist with the, with the institutions because it's very difficult to obtain documents, to know uh, in this multi-column document which is the real amendment, who is proposing what, and, and on behalf of, uh, of whom. So to make uh, the story short, uh, we will see in June if the parliament will be able to adopt his own mandate uh, with these 700 and, and more uh, amendments. And then the, the dance will start with the council who has already adopted his own position in December last year. Um, <clears throat> what I can say is that uh, the, the work that uh, two co-rapporteurs has done was to try to uh, correct uh, the market orientation of the, of the original proposal. And as Eleni was, uh, um, was saying, they um, inserted some very interesting amendments by inserting between the forbidden practices the predictive policing, 
uh, because they have to respect the principle of uh, um, um, presumption of, of innocence, obviously. Then um, they have also uh, made clear that in, in the lower level, which is the one of the high risk uh, artificial intelligence system, uh, children should be protected. Uh, moreover, as Eleni was recalling, there is the problem of the uh, artificial intelligence system used by candidates or parties to influence votes in local, national, uh, or even European election. Uh, and even the system used to count the votes because they have the potential by influencing a large number of citizens of the Union to impact on the very functioning of our democracy. So uh, other application, IRIS application, are the system used for the triage of patients in the healthcare se sector. And you may remind what happened during the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, and also, it's uh, very interesting that the reporters have asked uh, the two types of uh, artificial uh, intelligence system should be subject to both transparency requirement and to the conformity requirements. Uh, and this is the um, so-called deep fakes impersonating real persons and the editorial content written by uh, the artificial in, uh, intelligence. So the chat, um, chat GBT uh, uh, like uh, programs. Uh, moreover, uh, there is a, a, a strong pressure for making the new uh, artificial intelligence board uh, not only a, 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 council, uh, a council body, but also uh, um, giving him the possibility to prepare some uh, reg guidelines and also checking if a uh, violation took place. Um, moreover, uh, there is uh, the, the endeavor to uh, empower the, um, the users of high risk a system uh, who are uh, focused on protecting health, safety, and fundamental rights of citizens. And again, uh, there is a, the creation of a, a stronger, uh, according to the rapporteur, system of control. So I can continue for, because there are 700, <laughs> but maybe we have to finish before uh, tomorrow. So uh, I will <laughs> close it here. Thank you so much for that update. And what I'm hearing is, one, uh, transparency is crucial. And on that note, I want to congratulate you again on the transparency case and for all your work to get trans access to some of these conversations. Because another thing that is concerning is uh, conversations happening behind doors with powerful actors who might that be. And that's not uh, you know, that we see that across different jurisdictions, not necessarily one country or one company, but across different jurisdictions. So what I'm hearing is it's going to be a question of Transparency of the conversations, ability to, uh, to Eleni's point, ability to keep these bans that protect fundamental rights, uh, as well as still a lot for civil society to do or work on or push for uh, between the plenary vote and during the tr trial of process. Um, Shade, I want to come back to you on uh, we just celebrated 50 year of GDPR, and we hear a lot about the Brussels effect with GDPR. And I would note that uh, with our flagship report, AI and Democratic Values Index, we looked at 75 countries, their national AI strategies and practices, and data protection was indeed something for different reasons in each country, but it was indeed something that has that uh, effect, the wrinkle, ripple effect. Do you see EU AI Act uh, as also having a Brussels effect uh, eventually? 
Potentially, uh, I think it has a it has a good um, it's it's on its way. Um, you know, Brussels has the the first mover advantage um, as it uh, has very often. Um, I think um, this is where we get to the the discussions about risk based approach versus rights approach. I think it's not a, a zero sum game. I think um, from our perspective, the risk based approach is essential, um, and it doesn't exclude um, rights not having uh, the proper safeguards. Um, so that is really something that we we are very we think is very important, and I think you see it back in 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 the international um, sphere as well. Um, so I think that's from that perspective, the e, uh, the AI Act can set the really the, the the tone for the regulation that is to come uh, outside of outside of the EU's borders. I think one important uh, and and really like uh, impactful aspect can be that we. That, that we would make want co-legislators to think about um, not making a first mover advantage into a first mover disadvantage, because that's also a thing um, where other parts of the world can see, well, actually, the principles are right, but the way that you know the devil is in the detail. And one of the aspects there that's really important for us is because it's such a complex technology, and when we have now these very fast developments on the generative AI uh, part, and where the council in December had um, come to their position um, with the general purpose AI um, provisions. And I was actually, um, uh, Cooper, the ambassadors came to an agreement on that uh, on that position in the week of the launch of uh, ChatGPT. So a lot's happened since then. Uh, the parliament uh, took very much note of that, obviously, and, and rightfully so. Um, but at the same time, it's a very complex discussion. The, the value chain uh, of AI is very complex. The tech stack is very complex. So we would urge um, everybody, um, including civil society and, um, uh, and governments, to look very carefully at where the responsibilities within the tech stack, within the uh, AI value chain, are placed. Um, you know, creators of, of big foundation models, very, very powerful models, they cannot necessarily foresee all the potential risks that come out downstream when you go to the application level, where you know human ingenuity and creativity comes into play, and you can, you have a, a lot of smart engineers that can think about a lot of ways in which things are, are applied, but you can't account for everything, um, and that's I think you know, that's a, an attestation to human ingenuity as well. But but the system, the, the architecture of the law needs to take in, that into account. If you take that, if you Put those responsibilities and uh, on the wrong uh, actors within the value chain. You can ha it can have a it can have a big impact on on where um, where the developments go. Um, so that's I think a very important aspect that will frankly determine, in my view, whether or not this this can have have a Brussels effect. I think the legislative side is 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 one. Piece. It's a very important piece. As Microsoft, we think it's very important that uh, there is regulation in this space. Uh, it's new technology. Um, it needs to be regulated in an appropriate manner. Um, but it's it's there's two pillars. It's 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 the regulatory side, but it's also the corporate responsibility side. And and we also believe that companies need to really um, lean into that or step up or whichever bodily movement you want to <laughs> use to kind of make that clear. Um, and, and that's why we, we've also um, been thinking a lot about responsible AI, and res we have the, we've been working on this very intensively for the past six years, with our responsible with our uh, responsible AI principles uh, that came into a standard. So we're giving our engineers the tools and also um, uh, the rules internally to kind of think about how they deploy and, and work on uh, on responsible um, uh, technology. And we also we publish the standard publicly, so it's it's now also and we also uh, encourage and work with our with our customers to to do the same. Um, and and yesterday actually, and I, I wanted to flag it today because it's it's an important uh, it's an important thing that that we we had yesterday where um, our president uh, Brad Smith had a had, gave a speech and we 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 have got a blog post on how we think um, given all these uh, developments we think. Sh um, Policymakers and companies should should look at uh, at regulating AI and, and dealing with the emerging issues. 
Um, and, and I really, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting blog post. You go, just go to Bing chat and you feel that you say, uh, please give me the Brad Smith's co uh, blog on uh, responsible AI from yesterday and then you'll get it, um, it's very easy. Um, but it, it, it has a couple of important aspects that we, we it has five, it's five, uh, a blueprint with five uh, aspects. And, and, and on top of it is basically the idea that humans need to be in control uh, very strongly. Uh, that's really essential. That's a choice we need to make, we think, um, uh, as, as a society. And, and, one of th and the first one, I'll go very quickly through them because uh, I'm looking at the time, is implement and build upon gov on new government-led AI safety frameworks. And one of them is, is the NIST that we are very, uh, think is very good. Um, the second is to develop a broad legal and regulatory framework based on the technology architecture of AI. As I just indicated, you have to look at the tech stack. Uh, the application layer, and that's going to be the multitude of, of all the apps. There, we really think we should look very carefully at the existing regulations that are there. GDPR, every, you know, all these kinds of uh, important regulations, they need to be applied onto this new uh, tech uh, and onto these new applications. And that's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of resources. It was mentioned in the, in the, in the main panel with the, the uh, Secretary General of the EDPB. This is something that the DPAs will need to lead into and also get additional funding. Um, but there's also the highly capable AI foundation models. And those are um, is something that we also need to look carefully at. And there um, we, are really, we are saying that we think there should be a licensing uh, uh, regime for uh, uh, the important class of, of highly capable models that are at the frontier of research and development. Um, and, um, and there also, we're in, in, on, the, on the US side, we're calling for a, for a new regulator to have to, to breathe that uh, brief life into that licensing regime. And of course, you'll have discussions of what's the capability threshold and is it, is it compute power, is it, but, but that's really something that's, that we think is important. And there's also the infrastructure layer, because as you know, we may know, I mean, we have a partnership or an important cooperation with OpenAI. I want to challenge a bit um, Daniel's comment about, you know, we're basically determining, no, we're not determining what OpenAI does, we, they are their own, thank you, that's just, just someone <laughs> put, a, put an emphasis on we'll the point. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, that's uh, the dog goal. Um, um, that, that's really their, their own company, they have their own, uh, and they can market the product themselves, they have their own viewpoints. But to a large extent, we, we are aligned on, on some of these issues uh, mm. in terms of how to look at the regulation. and. There on the infrastructure layer, we're also really thinking that there needs to be obligations uh, on operators that, that have the capacity because OpenAI's model was, was specifically trained on a massive data center that was built specifically for that uh, in Iowa. And, and it's not something that every uh, uh, model builder can do. And, and those types of infrastructure need also to be regulated. There's cyber security issues, there's uh, physical security, safety architecture and potentially even export control uh, considerations that we need to take into account. So those are some of the aspects that we think um, are very important. And an additional thing uh, we wanted to mention is uh, safety breaks for AI systems that are dealing with critical infrastructure. Because more and more these are deployed in critical infrastructure, there needs to be a handbrake, so to say. If, uh, and finally, I'm, I'll just very quickly, promoting transparency, ensuring academic and nonprofit access to AI. Um, and uh, new public-private partnerships to use AI um, to, to learn from the recent years what we've been able to do also in the context of, of COVID, in the context of the war in Ukraine. Um, when when uh, actors come together, co companies, governments, nonprofits, to really um, move this forward and move the needle very quickly. So that's, uh, I think, an important thing to, to mention. Thanks. Thank you, and thanks for sharing the, the up updates, I think. Next, after the panel, after the next session as well, like ch we'll check out the the, the blog as well. Uh, may, may I? May I? Uh, yes, on the I, yeah, press. Please. Ah. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I was gonna turn the, to the side because I know like you're <laughs> frantically taking notes as well. So please go ahead. No, thank you very much for all this uh, this information. I, I more wanted to go back to the I mean the text. That's my problem. Uh, where we see a lot of resemblance with actual wording that was used in the GDPR, what has been interpreted as the Brussels effect. 
and uh, there is a clear provision talking, uh, uh, stating that the regulation applies to providers that are placing on the market or are putting into service AI systems in the union. Nothing about the practices, so already a problem. Uh, irrespective of whether those providers are established within the union or in a third country. And we see that the parliament amended this, replacing providers with operators. And I was going through the amendments, if I'm not mistaken, because it's a huge document. I didn't find the definition of the operator. So I was just wondering if within this panel we want to, to discuss whether that actually has a meaning. Probably there was something behind it. Uh, and also whether we are having an over-expansive, I mean, there is the Brussels effect, and then there is the Brussels, 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 Brussels effect, uh, because also the regulation, uh, because of its nature, does not apply only to those providers, but also to users of AI systems that are located within the union, to providers and users of AI systems that are located in a third country where the output produced by the systems is uh, used in the union, and now the Parliament, if I'm not mistaken, added also uh, that it applies also to natural persons affected by the use of an AI system. Who's out? I mean, we talk about value chain, we talk about entities. It's, a, it's about everything. Are we able, as, you, as Europe, to even enforce it? Shall we go there? Do we want to go into the enforcement debate? I mean, it's good to talk about principles and human rights and values and everything, but if we are creating a system that is completely imaginary, so... I mean, just, I mean, I, I think this affected person things is actually very important because, you know, as the Emilio laid out the criticisms, this is a, a market, it's a product safety legislation. And actually within, you know, the, the terminology is confusing. So when a lot of people read it, or they hear users, they think people who use AI systems, like, you know, people who use social media, it's users means deployers. It's provider is the developer, the one who puts it on the market. The user of the system is the entity that deploys it, like a police department, something like that. And one of the big issues was that affected people were not included. That was just not a category within the regulation. So that was the thing that we were pushing for and that we have now seen in the in the parliament text that like affected people actually potentially have rights under the AI Act. And it goes back a bit to, you know, something you raised, Delaney, that like, how does the AI Act protect rights? And I think you rightly pointed to the prohibitive practices, you know, that's really rights based. Uh, that's, you know, these things infringe rights to an unacceptable degree. But it's something that we've been pushing for. And when I say we, I mean Access Now, but we've also been working in a broad coalition of other civil society organizations. Um, for other things that, you know, could improve what's on the table so that it actually makes a difference to people. Like one thing is, as I mentioned, rights for affected people, a right to complaint, a right to redress. But also, if you look at the original AI Act, it's very provider focused. So it's a conformity assessment per, for providers, but very little uh, for users, so the entity deploying a system. But as everyone knows who's read a bit about AI, the context of deployment will have a huge impact on how that impacts people's rights. So we pushed for a fundamental rights impact assessment, and we apologize for the new acronym. Um, <laughs> But this has been taken up um, where the, the entity deploying the AI system would actually have to do an impact assessment uh, to, you know, lay out how this could potentially impact um, people's rights. There's an interesting discussion to have there about whether, you know, while that overlaps with a DPIA, is a DPIA already enough? Um, but, you know, that that is an interesting thing. But generally, I think what we're doing and you know what the parliament has tried to do as other people have said is try to make this something that potentially works for people's rights but to link this to the brussels effect question i, I think we have to ask following from what everything emiliano said like do we want a brussels effect <laughs> for the ai act that's not like uh, a, a given like, i think with the gdpr we did because you know when the gdpr was proposed that was what civil society wanted that was starting from a position of let's protect people's rights the ai act wasn't and you know we we had a d difficult discussion of like we really don't like the starting point and do we just disengage or do we try to make it work for people but we've already seen in brazil i haven't followed it closely but it 
what I have seen confirmed one of my worst suspicions is that the list of prohibitive practices was copy pasted. Yep. And that was my worry that those four very limited things in the original text would be taken as the only four things that needed to be prohibited. Um, and that's very dangerous because that list is not possible to update in the AI Act. The high risk list can be amended through a delegated act. But after adoption, the list of prohibitive practices cannot be amended. And to be honest, the first three prohibitive practices are very underwhelming. And then the fourth one is important in terms of topic, but it had a lot of exceptions. Now, we're very happy with this list that um, Eleni read out. But it, uh, the other big, big issue with, with the Brussels effect is that the AI Act is potentially useful as a layer to add on top of what we've already got with the GDPR. Because to give you a concrete example, I typically don't know that an AI system is in use. I don't know that my local police are using an AI system. I don't know that I've been affected by it. Algorithm Watch NGO that we work with all the time do a report that literally just finds out who is using AI systems and any basic information about them. And usually all you have is marketing materials. And sometimes we've even seen that when we see like red flags in marketing materials and we ask for more information, the marketing materials disappear from the company's websites. <laughs> so we need to know, like if we know, it, it, maybe not all of you know, under the AI Act, a high risk AI system has to be registered in a publicly viewable database so that in the original draft, we know it's on the market. We pushed and it's in the, in the parliament position now that also the deployments would be listed only for public authorities. We suggested it should be for all. But, but that would mean that as a citizen, you know, uh, as someone in the EU, you, you know a system is being used, you know documentation exists, you can then do freedom of information requests, and you're, you're more enabled to enact the rights you already have under the GDPR. But if that's exported, you know, there, there's huge appetite among lawmakers now to do something about generative AI or chat GPT. They might enact like AI regulation. It will be risk based. It will probably copy a lot of the AI Act, but maybe they don't have a data protection regulation. Now, Brazil does. So then you have this, this marriage. But if you have the AI Act somewhere where you don't have something like the GDPR, not that it has to be an exact copy, but, but it's not going to be as effective. It, it's really a potentially interesting addendum to the GDPR and, and other regulation. But in itself, it's, it's not <laughs> worth much. Yeah, exactly, exactly my point. And I think this goes back to the point of <laughs> Emilio in the beginning that we have the two legal bases. The Commission could not decide. Huh? It was like, yeah, well, a bit of data protection should be there, but not too much. Let's respect the GDPR. Let's respect the lead. Now we see a bit more addition to that in the text as well, not only the preamble. But that requires something that I don't think we have the time for, and I'm afraid for the final result, to be honest. If, if, if I can just <clears throat> confirm this sort of hybridation of the two legal bases, it's also mirrored in the way how uh, the implementation of the uh, act will be done, because uh, this is the reason why our co-rapporteur uh, have asked for a close cooperation, not only between the data protection authorities, but also the market surveillance authorities, uh, because uh, the enforcement of this uh, act will require both competencies. And uh, it's also interesting that in case of violation uh, or infringement of fundamental rights, also the relevant rights bodies inside the member states should be closely involved. And um, I will just took a note that in order to take possible issues impacting individual in several member states, the uh, co-rapporteur have proposed a new enforcement mechanism by the Commission to be triggered in case of widespread infringement, meaning three or more member states, including in case of inaction or infringement impacting at least three member states. This mechanism, uh, in fact, is based on the Digital Service Act yes. uh, and uh, should be obviously uh, adapted to the art uh, um, artificial intelligence legislation and maybe will be also a learning path to correct uh, or to implement or to modify the Annex 3 of the regulation. Uh, but it's also interesting because uh, the co-rapporteur 
uh, ever asked that in cases of wads, widespread infringement, the Commission should have the power of a market surveillance authority on the model of the market surveillance and compliance legislation. So, as I was trying to, <laughs> we will learn by doing, and uh, like children, we will, oh, I hope, learn by errors <laughs> and uh, modify this act. But it was expected because this is a new domain, and again, uh, you try to uh, uh, take the most possible uh, of, of this uh, situation. Thank you for that, for all, all of your comments as well. Uh, we don't want to be multiplying or amplifying the errors as we learn either, right? So if we're going to have an effect, global effect, it needs to be on the start on the right footing. Uh, I have more questions, but I do want to open it up to the audience. So uh, I know we have maybe 12, 13 minutes uh, left. So uh, please go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Sophia, and I'm uh, working on AI policy for the ICO, the UK Data Protection Authority. Uh, we're not a member of the EU anymore, so I cannot be really critical of the EU I act, really. But I think anything that kind of like supports people and their rights, I think, is welcome across the board. Um, I'm, I wasn't familiar with the kind of like tension between a risk-based and, and rights-based approach. I think this is a false dichotomy in my mind. I don't know how this came up. But uh, my question is, uh, one thing we have seen in terms of GDPR enforcement is that we have companies who are developing systems in third countries uh, that are challenging the extraterritoriality of the GDPR. And I'm just wondering to what extent you think the EU AI Act has all the provisions it needs to make enforcement real for companies that may be training their models in other countries. And uh, the second question is how you ensure the uh, national competent authorities will have the necessary resources to actually enforce the, enforce the legislation, because I do think existing DPAs are already understaffed in the EU. But I may be wrong. But just a point I wanted to raise. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, did you have any specific panelist names, or I'm going to open it up to who? Uh, no, whoever wants to answer the question. Thank you. Well, I can, I, I can start. I don't think I can, uh, I can properly answer the first one because you already heard me being quite uh, worried whether we can actually enforce what we're proposing. So I guess you have your answer. I know the the ICO has a very interesting guidance on AI and data protection, and thank you for that. You tried to <laughs> nail some things down. Uh, with regard to the question about the the DPAs, I think the problem is broader. Everyone in this room and beyond is aware of the fact that all data protection authorities in the EU uh, member states are understaffed. Now, the problem is that we are going to look into other national supervisory authorities that have to do with market. We don't know exactly what the um, artificial intelligence board will be, and also who, what will be, correct me if I'm wrong, which will be the national authorities that will be responsible for the AI Act. I have been hearing discussions that in some countries it may be the DPAs, some other can say we may establish new ones or have different ones or have different collaborating. So actually the problem is much broader because we are bringing a lot of work on national supervisory authorities that are understaffed in all fields. So it's not only a data protection problem. Can I <coughs> respond to that a, a little bit as well? Um, just on, on the risk and rights based, and I see Katerina Demetso here in the audience raising eyebrows at, at it as well. Um, but I mean, we, we wouldn't say it's, it's an absolute dichotomy, but I think it's very clear that the AI Act very much begins without rights. It doesn't grant rights to people. It's, it's risk based. It doesn't apply to all AI systems. It only applies to things that fit within a certain risk category. With the GDPR, there are obviously risk based elements within it. Uh, DPIAs, for example, and other things, but there are rights for people that you know apply. You know, and, and uh, regardless, it's not only for high-risk uses of data or something like that. So it's not a fundamental dichotomy, but there's there's definitely a, a different approach. But on enforcement, and which also links very much to the, the risk-based approach question, I just want to flag what for me for us is probably the most dangerous thing that's happening with the AI Act. 
And a lot of people are focused on the prohibitions and there are multiple reasons for that. It's easy to understand. It's sensational. Newspapers love it. It gets headlines. It gets retweets. But there's other very, very important things that are much less amenable to, to that sort of attention. And one is Article 6. And Article 6 is actually the core of the AI Act's risk-based approach. And in the original commission draft, it's totally unremarkable. Article 6.2, I mean. Uh, and it says, if a system does one of the things in Annex 3, the list of high-risk use cases, it's high risk. So if you're an AI system and you do one of those things, you're high risk. The council amended that to add an exception if the system is purely accessory. But it's the provider themselves that decide that. So the entity to be regulated decides whether or not they should be high risk. And if they decide that they're not, they're just not in scope. And there's no one to check that. There's no you know, registration. There's no demand for an exemption or something like that. The parliament has done something quite bad as well, where they've said that they've added a kind of a filter so that you have to do one of the things in Annex 3. And, and if you pose a significant risk, then you're high risk. But the provider again assesses. Now, they've added some guardrails, like uh, notifying the, I think it's the National Supervisory Authority who have 30 days to respond. But this links back to the, the staffing question and the resources question. What about if, you know, I think providers are going to be incentivized to try and take that exemption, to take that loophole. If a uh, National Supervisory Authority is getting hundreds per month of requests, you know, saying that, well, we're going to exempt ourselves. Are they going to be able to follow all of those up? So for so this is like, we already thought the risk-based approach of the AI Act was problematic, but this is just cutting a huge loophole into it uh, that is really, really dangerous. And I think all the attention needs to be on this in the trilogues, not to be distracted by the things that will take the headlines much more, because that is where the big tech lobbying has been successful. That is a direct result of all of this, and it's gone under the radar. So really, that is the key key fight, I think, in the trilogues. Thank you, Daniel, for highlighting that before we finish the panel as well. Uh, next question. Hi, I'm Dave Lewis from the ADAPT Centre in Trinity College, Dublin. I just going back to this point about enforcement, I mean, it seems a really challenging ask for the even the Annex to current uh, uh, market surveillance authorities are going to have to expand their competence from health and safety to cover fundamental rights and the legislation that, that supports that and probably new bodies in the Annex 3 areas that even don't even do now health and safety have to expand those competencies. So do we have much idea of how these bodies and there'll be multiple ones in each member state are going to you know, develop these competencies and make sure that they're they're consistent between them. I mean, that's probably not a requirement, but it would be it would be uh, you know attractive if they were. Uh, is is there any discussion about how you know member states are going to ramp up that? That seems to be a very big training and competence uh, step. Emilio, do you want to take that? Uh, you know, if Cleopatra has a different nose, maybe the history will be different. The point is that we try to say that uh, this uh, organization is too complex and the most pieces you have, the most pieces you risk to break. But at the end of the day, you have also to respect the fact that member states want their own internal organization and, and, and this creates big problem of consistency, but already also in the general data protection regulation, because uh, even if there was someone who was suggesting to follow a, a simpler approach like the one of the competition, uh, where you have a, a, a different, uh, only two levels of, of treatment, now uh, you are obliged to trust the goodwill of people to cooperate, to, uh, to share information, to have enough uh, um, means. I can't say if the result, the final result, will uh, fit to, the, to what is uh, uh, needed. But again, this is something that we should look uh, when the trilogues will take place. Uh, is it clearly one of the most Sensi sensitive uh, aspects. Thank you. Next question. Hi, 
This is Margarita Maxopoulou from researcher at the Queen Mary University of London. It's true what Emilio said about, I mean, we, it's inevitable. We are going to learn through our mistakes like children do, but we also want to make sure that we will at least uh, make small mistakes instead of big ones. So I wanted to just stress, we, we heard from Microsoft that it's important, I mean, our fundamental rights are important. It's very important to investigate what's wrong with foundational models, for example. It's important to, for smaller actors, not for profit actors, to get engaged with this work. This is all very good. But then I heard about the licensing regime. I mean, as we know, it's the most clear, straightforward way to actually interrogate uh, research it's, is to have this open in the public for the research community. How could, I mean, it's so valuable that research is open source so that the other researchers can go there and see what's wrong, can make suggestions. How could this be protected? How could we ensure that this remains true if we establish a licensing regime? Yeah. Th thanks for that question. I mean, I, I, I think there I might have not been clear enough. The licensing regime is would be for very high capacity uh, models. So they would need to. Uh, it's it's not that it would mean researchers would need to get a, a license to be able to to access it. It's really about getting uh, making sure that that really the those super powerful models. Um, are are regulated in in a proper manner, uh, so the developers of of those. Um, in terms of of research, um, you know, we we fully underline under and, and understand the importance of um, transparency um, for and and also so one of the commitments we've made we're making is to ensure that academic and non nonprofits will have better access to compute power and also more transparency about what the model uh, provides and, and so and and the technology behind it now obviously there's you know it's it's not a a, a full on we open up everything because there are security risks uh, that we need to take into account there are things that are um that are important to uh not put out there completely um but there is a we are really looking towards making sure that for specific areas, there are there is a specific type of transparency, um, and again, it's not it's not about licensing uh, access to uh, uh, for researchers in order to be able to get access to those models. It's really about uh, ensuring regulation for the proper uh, for those really high-powered models. Just to want to clarify that. Thanks. Thank, thank you for that clarification, uh, and thank you for all of my panelists for their insightful comments uh, and as well as their advocacy and further work. Really appreciate you being here today, uh, all four of you, and really appreciate you being here <laughs> at the very end of the uh, conference. I know we're sitting between you uh, and the EDPS closing remarks. Thank you so much for your attendance and looking forward to further conversations in the future.